Hey, what's up? I'm Nathan. Um, you may know my work uh, from GitHub's Atom Code Editor. I was uh, a founding member of the Atom Editor team. And about a year ago, uh, a couple teammates uh, from Atom and I started a company called Zed to apply everything we learned building Atom and also achieve uh, some of the dreams that we'd always been hoping for from the beginning of Atom. And I think we're finally lined up on target to finally deliver. Uh, so the core of that was really, uh, uh, really embodied by the tagline of GitHub in late 2011 when I joined them to build Atom which is social coding. And I always love this tagline because um, I kind of always resented the stereotype of a software developer as this like antisocial troll that preferred to talk to computers over people and like coded in a dark basement with no windows on a, on a monochrome display. Like there's obviously a grain of truth in, in that stereotype or it wouldn't exist. Um, but I never felt like it applied to me. Uh, I love intellectualism and, and ideas and abstractions, but I also love people. Um, and for me, software has always been this uh, perfect combination of, of the two. Um, any non-trivial piece of software is gonna involve uh, lots of different people. And those people need to be communicating effectively in order to uh, build a shared mental model with each other, of shared vocabulary um, and you know, make come to consensus. Uh, if anything, the complexity of, of the concepts we're dealing with when we're building a, a complex piece of software uh, demand more of us socially than, than a lot of other uh, endeavors of human activity. I, I think software is actually hyper social. And so it's the conversations that we're having with our fellow engineers about the code that we're writing. Um, I think those conversations are, are every bit as important as the conversation we're having with the computers that are running that code. Uh, early on at GitHub, again, uh, when I joined, it, like, was this concept of be asynchronous. That was like a mantra at the company. Um, Git at that point was really new. And at least in my experience for the first time, Git enabled this, this workflow of feature branching. Uh, it existed in version control systems uh, predating Git but I'd never seen it work well. Git made it work. So multiple people being able to work independently on, on different stuff in the same code base on their own schedules, uh, even if they didn't know each other, even if they didn't ask each other permission. Uh, and then GitHub created this concept of pull requests that allowed um, a conversation to occur around those changes and that to be integrated uh, at a, a point of the maintainer's choosing. And that was really like, it's commonplace now after 15 years, but like at that point in time, was revolutionary and I think is responsible for a lot of the innovation we've seen in the industry over the last 15 years. Um, and right before I joined, uh, Zach Holman, an early employee at the company, um, wrote this blog post as part of a series uh, that was kind of documenting how GitHub had been working. Um, and the title of the post was Be Asynchronous. And the key idea was, not only could we use pull requests uh, to mediate interaction in an open source context when people didn't trust each other and weren't coordinating closely, but that that same asynchronous workflow could work inside the walls of a company. You know, and at that time, that was a really new idea. I, Git was, GitHub was kind of out on the forefront. Uh, we were an early user of this thing Slack, which predated a camp, or we, sorry, of this thing Campfire, which predated Slack. Uh, by several years as like a chat service and there were githubbers all over the world in all different time zones um, contributing almost in this like open source way inside the company to github the product uh, and that felt pretty new at the time um, and so you know obviously at this point pull requests and the whole async workflow have become this like you know given natural part of how we all work but at that point it was new um, that said, I never fully bought in on this idea that everything should be done via pull requests. In an open source context, obviously that makes a ton of sense. There really isn't another choice for the most part. Um, people are working at different times. People don't necessarily trust each other. 
uh, I don't know when someone's making a change that it's really worth my time to invest uh, in, in interacting around that until they've sort of made it and they have a proposal and it builds green on CI. But inside of a company, and especially inside of an individual team, the situation is much different. Um, we are all paid a salary. We all have committed, even if we're working in different time zones, to have some level of schedule overlap with each other. We're all hanging out in the same Slack or Discord. Um, you know, it's, it, we're not, it's not open source. It's a different scenario. And so while obviously like pull requests are this indispensable tool, I would never want to not have them. And there's plenty of situations where they make sense. I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we try to funnel kind of all of our interaction around code through this asynchronous workflow. There's tremendous value in, in being synchronous. Uh, you can just have richer conversations. You can transfer knowledge. Uh, you can explore ideas together and have a dialogue that goes back and forth and rapid fire. You can kind of interrupt someone's flow if they're going down a path that doesn't make sense before they go write a bunch of code around it. So I think there's tremendous value in being able to have conversations about code as we are writing code, not hours or days later after we've already written the code. Um, and in the old days when we all worked in buildings together, uh, having those kinds of conversations was pretty easy, you know, involved like rolling your air on chair over to your teammate's desk and, uh, you know, just looking at the screen and talking about code. Um, or, you know, my experience at, at Pivotal Labs, we actually had two keyboards and, and two mice plugged into every computer and we, we pair programmed all day long. So we wrote code together. And I think, you know, everything in between in a physical setting is, is, is possible. Um, but as we go more remote as an industry in general, uh, I think those kinds of conversations are getting harder and they're becoming fewer and further between. If I wanna talk about code as I'm writing it, like what are really my choices? Um, I could paste it into Slack, I guess, uh, and use some back ticks, uh, you know, to show that it's code, but really I'm talking about something, especially if I'm talking about code that I'm writing that nobody else can see. Um, I could fire up a screen sharing session, but that often feels like a pretty big commitment, pretty heavy weight and, and something that doesn't feel quite natural to do in all circumstances. Um, or maybe I push a WIP commit up to GitHub and like open a draft pull request and have a conversation there, but that has an awkwardness to it. There's really no great way to do it. And so I feel like what we end up doing in a lot of cases is we just delay the conversation. Uh, we, we go with the flow of our tools and our tools are better at asynchronous workflows. And so that's what we do. And we open pull requests and, and do code review and we embrace that async model. Um, but I don't always think that that's the most natural and the most optimal way of engaging in conversations around code. Uh, we're, we're, we're missing context. We're missing opportunities to share knowledge. Uh, we're missing some of the advantages of all being employed and, and part of a tight knit team. Um, and I think as a result, the quality of our code is suffering and the quality of our team dynamics are, are really suffering as well. Uh, and at the root of it, I think it's, it's really a tooling problem. And so that's uh, the problem that we're setting out to solve with Zed. Um, we think that the, the unit of collaboration, which at this point is sort of branches and commits and pull requests, these fairly coarse grained units, we wanna dial that granularity of collaboration down to individual keystrokes. And our goal is to make it frictionless to have conversations about code kind of on any time scale from the individual keystroke on up. Um, and so, you know, that lets us write code together in real time. And I think that'll be really cool, but also the technologies that make that possible um, will also make it really doable to have like text-based, like, like kind of Slack style chat conversations that are intermingled and tied to the code uh, as a reference. Um, and also just tie code uh, conversations to code on a go forward basis. So rather than having, you know, a conversation that's attached to a commit or a diff, actually have that conversation beyond the code and ride along with the code in perpetuity forward through, through the history of time. Um, and yes, that's really our goal. And to make that more concrete, like 
just do a little user story here. I mean, there's a bunch of possibilities, but one idea I have is like, say there's a new uh, team member, you know, on, on the Z code base. And in fact, like this is an example from our own experience. Um, so, you know, they've been around for a few weeks. Uh, they're starting to get the ropes of how things work and they have an idea for a change. That idea is motivated by some bigger change they're trying to make, but they want to change some core API of the system. And so they, you know, they could go make that change, but maybe it's pretty expensive. It might take them a couple hours to, to open a pull request that would build green with that change. And they don't even know that that's like necessarily a good idea. So like, are they, again, are they talking about it with people in Slack? Did they fire up a screen sharing session? Like that can feel really awkward. And the vision that we have is they just like in the editor, highlight a piece of code and, you know, kind of call it out. Hey, I have this idea. Maybe the tool automatically decides, oh, there's a few people that like edit this file frequently uh, or we're editing it recently. They should be notified. And those people sort of see the little excerpt of the code that the person commented on. Um, but they're also positioned to uh, like click it and jump into a window that has the code exactly as it looked for the person that, that wrote the original question or, or proposed the original idea. And they could navigate around and, and look at all the context uh, with a cursor. They could have a conversation back and forth. And maybe at some point they decide, hey, let's like open an audio channel and like unmute the mic and like start talking about this with our voices. And now they've both got cursors and they're both equal peers and they can type and sketch out some ideas with each other. Maybe they, they come to a conclusion together uh, after conversing and they go ahead and implement the change. And, you know, an hour later, they've been working together and, you know, they've implemented this change. They're ready to commit it. And they can check a box that says, take all this conversation history and like save it and cross-reference it with the code so that anybody at some later point in time uh, can see a conversation took place here. They can see what, you know, the, the chat conversation was and even potentially like replay the editing session directly in their editor and watch that code being written to get context on it if they need it. I just think there's a ton of value that's, that could be captured in, the, in a discussion like that and, and kind of tied to the code and drawn on later that just sort of gets lost when it scrolls off the, you know, the first page of, of merged pull requests um, when things are done async. Um, so that's the vision. Now, to, you may ask, like, why hasn't this already happened? Uh, or you may say, okay, I tried a tool like this. Like, you know, other people have attempted things like this and it, it sucked. It wasn't good. Um, so, you know, big deal. I, I'm not interested. Um, I think what's going on here is that, you know, re this like fine grained and real time code collaboration hasn't had its, what I call the iPhone moment. Uh, you know, I remember before the iPhone existed, there were things like the Palm Pilot or even before that, like the Apple Newton. And I never felt like those, those products kind of justified their bulk. It wasn't something that it made sense to throw in my bag and drag around. And so you'd be forgiven in like 2006 for saying, um, nobody wants a computer they can put in their pocket. But that could not have been further from the truth. Everybody wanted a computer they could put in their pocket. It's just nobody had executed a, a pocket computer uh, super well before Apple came out with the iPhone. Um, and a big part of why they were able to do that was this attitude of building the whole widget, vertical integration, controlling every aspect of that experience, every component of that product to the degree necessary to deliver a product experience that really made mobile computing happen. Um, there were just ingredients that needed to all be present to make that work. Um, and I feel like it's the same with this collaborative code editing experience. If you wanna do collaboration in an editor agnostic way, you're pretty much taking snapshots of the file system and we already have uh, something like that, it's called Git. <laughs> um, and you could write a bunch of extensions for various editors um, but since those editors weren't really designed with this concern in mind, you're always going to be kind of delivering a half-baked, janky solution, and it's going to be inconsistent across the different editors. Um, just doesn't feel, I mean, I haven't seen a, a really solid execution of the vision that we're trying to go for. 
And we think the solution is to actually, you know, again, pull a move from Apple and vertically integrate, engineer the entire product experience and coding experience with the assumption that we want this fine grain level of collaboration, build the entire tool uh, around that. And so what that means is not only are we sort of tackling um, building this collaboration technology, um, but we've also got to build a really good code editor because I don't think you're going to pull out Zed only when you want to collaborate. I think you already need to be excited enough about the product that needs to be delivering enough for you in a single user capacity that you're already using it. It's a product you're happy to use both in a single player mode and in a multiplayer mode. Uh, and that's what we've set up to do. So beyond the collaboration stuff that I've talked about, like, what does that really mean? Um, how do we deliver a world-class code editing experience that, you know, stands on its own? Um, for me, that's a few different things. First and foremost, it's just amazing performance. And the standard with, uh, with us is like, if you type a key, there should be no perceptible delay at all um, to us responding to that action ever. <laughs> And the way that we can achieve no perceptible delay means that like on the next refresh of the monitor, you need to have a response. If we're keeping up with the refresh rate of your display, then you're not gonna be able to perceive a delay. So that's our goal. Um, we'll get into more about how we achieve that later. Uh, next is like clean, classy, tasteful UI design. Uh, it needs to look good, but also be minimal and out of your way. And uh, we've had a super talented designer on the team for a very long time from the beginning, uh, just iterating on that uh, to try to achieve that as well. Um, then there's innovative features that make you more productive. Uh, so there's the table stake stuff like labels or language server integration. Um, and we've also tried out some, some new ideas that I think are pretty cool, which I'll be showing off in the demo in a little bit. Um, and eventually, we haven't chosen to invest in this yet, but eventually, uh, extensibility is obviously a really big part of the story as well. Uh, you need to be able to uh, install packages that make the editor do things that we couldn't anticipate. Um, so, you know, that's something that was a priority with Adam. Uh, it's something we plan to get to uh, eventually with Zed once we've got a, a firm foothold with all the other goals that we have. Um, so that is definitely a work in progress, like, uh, but we have been using it full time for about two months now, um, to build itself. Uh, so it's, it's definitely working. It's real, it's stable. Um, and I'm going to dive in right now with a demo, uh, and show you what it's all about. Um, so let me, uh, unshare my, or unstart my slide presentation. Yeah. So. Here it is, here's Zed. Um, let me hide this, All right. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's a code editor. You can see the project browser over here, uh, open a file, um, syntax highlighting uh, powered by tree sitter. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, you know, one cool feature I really like is this outline view that we build from a syntax tree. Uh, that lets you kind of navigate the structure of the document. Uh, there's some cool things you can do around like issuing a query. So you can, you know, obviously query on the names of these individual methods or, or structures. Um, if you type a space in your query, you also match on these keywords. So I could say like, what are all the public structs in this file? Um, or, you know, the, you know, all the functions, all the public functions, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's one cool thing. Another cool feature uh, I'm really excited about is this thing called multi-buffers. So we use these all over the place, but a quick way to show them off is like, say I search for the word cursor across the entire project. Um, Sublime pulls up a, a view that looks like this, uh, where you can kind of, but in, in, you know, you see these excerpts from all the places that it contain the word cursor. Uh, but in the case of Zed, these excerpts are like editable. So I could create like a multi-cursor edit at this point and actually like insert a comment, hello, across all these files simultaneously. And if I hit save, uh, which I'm not gonna do, uh, it'll save a shotgun out to all these locations in these different files. So we use this multi-buffer uh, approach like when we're showing diagnostics across the project, when we're showing the results of refactorings that you've run, 
et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a cool construct. Uh, one cool feature as well is if I hit alt enter, um, I'll open up a tab for each of those spots where my cursor is, uh, you know, and that's like a kind of a cool way to like open up a bunch of tabs uh, referencing particular things. So anyway, let me uh, <laughs> close these without saving them. Uh, and yeah, the main event is gonna be showcasing uh, collaboration. So come up here and uh, turn on sharing. This is actually not gonna be in the alpha uh, when we launch, but for now, and then you can see it here, I can open this collaborators panel and here are my uh, three co-founders and what they're currently working on. Um, and so uh, if you guys haven't already, if you could add my co-founder Antonio into the stream. Um, hey everyone. Hey, hey. Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so hopefully the demo gods are going to be on our side. Uh, you want to hop into my Zed? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you can see Antonio. Basically, what he did is he just came here and uh, you know clicked on my project. It opened a new window for him, and you can see his avatar uh, up in my up in my title bar. So if I click on that avatar, I can jump to where Antonio is right now. There's his cursor and following him around. Um, and so what we thought would be cool to do today, just to demo like the product is a quick little pairing session on a feature we were working on the other day, uh, which is transpose. Transpose is just this ability to hit control T and like swap the two characters uh, at the point where the cursor's at. And one way that I like to work is like I split the screen and in the right pane, I'll, uh, I'll follow Antonio so I can keep an eye on what he's doing. And then in the left pane, I've got my own uh, ability to edit. Um, maybe I'll uh, close these panels, need a binding for this one, bump the font a little bit, um, help with the presentation. And yeah, uh, so yeah, we, like I said, we were doing this transpose feature. Here's this unit test we've been working on for it. So you can see like in the simple case, we have ABC and, and then we're running transpose and making assertions about what the text look like looks like and uh, what the selected ranges like basically where the cursor is in the editor um and you know one deficiency with the code as it exists here is that uh it's not clear that we're supporting multi-byte characters so antonio um maybe we should uh yeah yeah so, let's yeah, start by adding some uh a piece of a new stanza to the test that uh, maybe you could add some emojis uh so let's see that sounds good add, yeah paste some uh, let's see. Uh, so yeah, each of these this emojis is, is uh, four bytes long, so we cannot park the cursor midway through an emoji. Cool. Um, and I, we copied from the test above, which was like testing multi cursor. I don't think that really matters. So I'm going to go ahead and delete yeah, those ranges. Good. Yeah. We've okay. So this is elsewhere. and then let's work on the assertion. So like, I'm going to grab these emojis and mm -hmm. and paste them down here. Uh, I also think this the range needs to change because yeah, before it was just one byte, but given that a pair I think is four bytes long, I think we want to park the cursor midway through the the pair, and uh, yeah, that makes sense. So like the basketball comes before the pair, and then we have the pair. And I okay, guess, and then this yeah. would be eight, right? Uh, that sounds we right. Yeah, I think okay. both are that way. And so I think we want to return an editor here just because of how GPUI works. Okay, so okay. I think we can try and run the test, see how we do. Okay, that sounds good. So, you know, this is a missing piece right now. Let me see, I was running this test earlier. Um, where, you know, I'm obviously command tabbing out to a terminal. Uh, we definitely plan to integrate a terminal into the product. We just haven't gotten there yet. And obviously Antonio would be able to follow me into that terminal and type. There'll also be a test runner into the product that's like on our roadmap. Um, uh, but yeah, not there yet. So you can see, okay, I. Uh, ran the test and you, you can see the assertion failed. Byte index three is not a character boundary. It is inside of this pair emoji. Um, so clearly we have a problem. Let's uh, make the test pass. So you can see in the right pane, Antonio has jumped up to the transpose method. I could navigate there by just, you know, using this navigator uh, transpose, um, or I could just jump to Antonio's location since he's already there. Uh, and yeah, so what's yeah. going on here? Yeah, it seems like we do a bunch of manipulation with offsets and assuming it's all going to be ASCII. Uh, 
And so I think that's where we're uh, introducing the bug there. So maybe let's go ahead and check out all these uh, math, uh, math offset math that we're doing and uh, introduce clipping. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. So clipping is just this concept of taking a, a position that's like potentially invalid and, and making it valid. So that's what Antonio is doing right now. I'll, I'll do the same thing up here. Uh, so yeah, we have the display map. You know, these details are going to be too much to explain in this uh, in this context. But we use basically a snapshot of the buffer, and then I want to say clip offset, um, and take what I was originally just doing raw math on, doing a clip. And then when you clip an offset, you do so with a bias, um, which means basically if you're at an invalid location, which direction should we go to get to a valid one? So I'll say bias left in this case, um, save yeah, it cool. on the format. Yeah. And I did something similar over here because we were subtracting one. So presumably we wanted to go to the left of uh, the, the character. And I used the bias of right over here because we were uh, adding one to the offset because we want to grab the, the the piece of text that we want to transpose. Uh, Sweet. So, oh, maybe right. let's run it again. Give it a give it a spin. Um. Okay, it takes it takes a little to compile. It's the only part of Rust I don't absolutely <laughs> love to death. Okay, and the test passes. Yay! <laughs> we we knew because we practiced this a couple times. <laughs> Um, so anyway, that's a little demo of Zed. Uh, there's a lot more, uh, just subtle features, like just a lot involved in a uh, code editor that's usable to write real code. We've been using it for a couple months. Uh, so this isn't, wasn't really like a contrived demo. This is a pretty, you know, this was just a replay of something we actually did, uh, yesterday, uh, in, in pursuit of building some real code. Um, so yeah, it's a working product and, uh, there it is. So I'm going to. Say goodbye to Antonio. Thank you very much for collaborating. Thank you all. See ya. Bye. Um, and I'll dive back in on the presentation here. Um, so, yeah, how do we how do we do this? How do we, you know, to borrow another Appleism, make this kind of real time collaboration just work, as it were? Um, and there's a couple big pieces of it that I want to talk about. I can't go into major depth on either of them. Um, there's a, but yeah, the first big ingredient is this concept called conflict-free replicated data types. And yeah, so there are two big approaches to doing collaborative editing. There is a conflict-free replicated data types or CRDTs. And then an older approach called operational transformation or OT. And we ended up going with conflict-free, I'm just gonna say CRDTs uh, because they just felt like a simpler and more powerful, easy to implement framework for us. And, and the key idea of a, a CRDT is you design a data type in such a way that uh, the, the operations that manipulate that data type have some freedom with respect to their ordering. So if you just were to implement collaborative editing in a super naive way, Antonio, you know, he's in Italy, by the way. So as he's typing and interacting with the language server, et cetera, that's all coming from Italy. Um, so he might be, uh, he might say like, oh, I inserted a, an emoji at offset, you know, 1,000 whatever in the buffer. Um, and that worked great until the moment that I kind of did some typing concurrently with his insertion of the emoji, like earlier in the buffer and shifted all the text over. And all of a sudden that offset like doesn't make sense at all. So it's like a naive solution to that is like, oh, we'll just like put a locker on the editor, right? So every time Antonio tries to type, uh, he sends a packet from Italy to me that says like, okay, grab the lock, reserve the editor. Uh, and then I'm not allowed to type uh, until he inserts his keystroke and then I can type. But the problem with that is like, even at the speed of light, the, you know, the maximal theoretical possible latency that we could, or you know, the best possible latency we could get, uh, round tripping a packet from Italy is gonna take long enough to introduce like a pretty annoying and very perceptible delay in typing which undermines you know, the high performance experience that we're going for. Um, so the solution is to use CRDTs. And it's gonna, you know, I have a whole talk on this uh, from a few years ago when we built an early version of this for Adam. Uh, but the key idea of a CRDT is if all text that's ever inserted into the, into the document is, is given an identifier. So I might you know, say I paste a block of code. That whole block of code is given an identifier 
And then any subsequent uh, edits to that piece of code, um, the location of that edit is expressed in terms of an offset into that original code block. So you're never referring to kind of absolute offsets into the buffer, but only to relative positions within these immutable pieces of text that are introduced into the, into the buffer over time. Um, and when you delete stuff, you never really delete anything. You're just sort of hiding it um, so that people can still refer to it. And so what you end up with is this, this uh, it's called monotonically increasing kind of list of different snippets of text. Um, monotonicity is a really important property in these like eventually consistent data structures. Um, and, you know, that data is accreting over time. Um, and then we use techniques to sort of efficiently index that data and keep the memory footprint of it small uh, so that it all works in a practical sense. So that's one big piece of it. Another big piece is just like, it's a pretty freaking complicated distributed systems problem. When you think about like Antonio and potentially like, you know, especially in our Monday meetings, like we're editing our meeting notes with like six different people. Uh, there's a lot of different inter like interactions that are possible when, you know, there's all these people collaborating with our server and, you know, round tripping packets from Italy to New York, to Boulder, Colorado, back to New York and back to Italy. And then, you know, multiply that by someone doing that from Portland, et cetera. There's a lot of concurrency. Um, and so in the past, you know, obviously whenever you want to build a system and make it reliable, you need automated testing. Uh, but in the past, whenever I've done automated testing on an asynchronous system, you know, I'll write a test and it'll go green and I'm happy and I commit it and I push it to CI and all's well for a couple of days until some sequence of events occurs, maybe only happens half a percent of the time or something uh, that causes a bug and it fails the build. And so then, you know, whoever sees that checks out that branch and runs the test and it passes on their machine and they can't reproduce the bug. And so it's just a nightmare. It's a recipe to be in hell. <laughs> Um, it's something we really wanted to avoid on Zed. And so we were able to leverage, you know, Zed's written in Rust and we'll get more into that later, but like we were able to leverage the really unique uh, asynchronous model of Rust to um, basically write this thing called an executor. And so we fully simulate uh, the network interaction between clients and servers, um, fully simulate the file system, the database, that's all done in memory. And then we, we basically run all of these asynchronous interactions on an executor that controls the order in which each little bit of progress that any of the code can make is, is tightly controlled and fully deterministic. Um, and then we seed that executor with like a random seed and use a random number generator to execute all versions of asynchronous code in these like randomized orders. And so we can write a unit test that like spins up a server and connects three clients and has them do these interactions. And then we can run a thousand, 10,000 if we want different permutations of the way in which anything that is concurrent can be ordered uh, and find through brute force those tiny percentages of cases where things go wrong and then run that seed over and over again and fix those problems and then ship it to CI and know we're never gonna get flaky tests. So obviously like there's gonna be bugs, it's new software, like I'm not gonna stand here and, and guarantee that uh, there won't be any bugs, but this approach uh, of, of rigor and the ability to use Rust's uh, async infrastructure uh, to really gain a new level of rigor, um, something that we've applied throughout the product. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really confident that we're gonna be able to deliver like a solid collaboration experience that creates this illusion that we're just in the same code together. It doesn't matter that Antonio is in Italy and I'm in, in Boulder. Uh, it just works. Uh, another thing I would love to go into some detail on is how do we achieve world-class performance in a code editor? And so that starts with uh, using a systems programming language first and foremost. Um, I will never again attempt to write a code editor in JavaScript or any uh, single threaded runtime. Um, like it's super important uh, for a tool of, of, of this uh, critical you know, performance criticality and that's used all day, every day uh, by 
by professionals um, to not have a garbage collector that's going to pause randomly, um, to have tight control over where memory is allocated and, and freed, um, to be able to leverage every core uh, and move work into the background. Um, and that that's all stuff that, that using Rust uh, makes possible. Um, and what's great about Rust is like, it's incredibly expressive. So we can really do all of that while still as a small team, like making rapid progress and writing code that's, that's also really expressive. Um, so it's, it's been a joy and an amazing tool uh, to achieve these goals. A another like important thing is um, you gotta leverage the GPU and we've gotta minimize the amount of BS between like the user typing a key and pixels uh, getting to their screen. Um, so we tried early on to use Electron, like we, uh, we wrote a Rust core and then we would sort of ship data to Electron, which would do all the rendering and, and time and time again, it was just a bottleneck. We worked so hard in the core to make things fast and just blow it all away, uh, waiting for like styles to recalc or whatever nonsense the browser technology was doing. And finally we just said, screw it. Like we need to take control of this layer of the stack as well. Um, which led us to write GPUI. Um, this was a couple of years ago. And the key inside of GPUI, uh, which you know we didn't come up with, it came from the web render team at Mozilla. It's just like, you think about a modern GPU. So this is a screenshot from like the Unreal Engine. Um, and like each of those little colored things is like a triangle in this crazy like photorealistic scene that's being rendered in real time. Um, on a GPU, uh, they're redrawing the entire screen, like every frame. Um, you think about like that demo we just showed, you know, what do we have? Some rounded corners and some drop shadows, a couple Bezier curves and like, you know, glyphs and icons. Um, you know, if the GPU can handle this crazy 3D scene, like can it handle a simple t 2D UI? And so what we do with GPUI is it, it's kind of like React where, um, you know, we have a whole layer for like dealing with sort of the state of the views, et cetera. Um, and that's an interesting problem in and of itself. It's probably worthy of a whole talk around how we contend with Rust's strict ownership rules as we do that. Um, but for the rendering layer, it's like kind of like React, you render a tree of components and React, you render a tree of components and then you diff them with the last version. Uh, the framework does that and then it figures out uh, how do we manipulate this retained mode representation of what's on screen the dom um, and then you know you manipulate the dom and the browser sees you've done that and it does a style recalculation and a new layout and it paints and it goes through all this nonsense and we're just like let's just cut that all out we do the same tree of components we call them elements and then we just start at the top of the tree perform a layout pass from top to bottom and then back up uh, then we do another pass that paints, uh, which is basically just writing data into this object called a scene. And then we hand the scene to a cross-platform render. Right now we're only targeting uh, metal on the Mac. Uh, and in about 300 lines of shader code, we support all the different types of geometry we need. Like I mentioned, Bezier curves, rounded corners, drop shadows, a few other things. Um, and you know, we go from here's what we want to uh, pixels on the screen in like a couple milliseconds. Um, obviously we could add some caching somewhere in there potentially to improve the power efficiency, but like we're already way better than electron apps in that regard. And like, uh, the latency is really excellent as well. So for now, like we're really happy with the approach, um, running short on time, but we make heavy use of persistent data structures and multi-threading. So like, for example, uh, one thing we can do thanks to Rust's async model is like when we soft wrap, say you like have a soft wrap document and you paste like multiple megabytes of text. We got to go through and analyze that and figure out where do we want to insert the soft wraps. We've got to update our indexing structures. Um, by using persistent structures, we're able to move that work into the background. And then on the foreground thread, we'll like block on it for a budgeted amount of time. So maybe like one millisecond. If the wrapping, like maybe type one character or paste something small, if the wrapping can be done in one millisecond, great. You see it on the next frame, you never even skip a beat. But if it's big enough that we can't do that batch work efficiently, um, then we'll actually like show you something interpolated. We'll actually show that 
text you inserted kind of flowing off the edge of the screen. And then a few frames later, when the work is done, we'll update the screen and show you the wrapped information. So uh, yeah, the, the key principle is just like, be responsive, no matter what. Responsiveness is job one. Uh, and then another really fundamental tool, both in delivering some of the features you saw, like syntax highlighting and uh, that outline view I was showing, is tree sitter. Uh, my other co-founder, Max Brunsfeld, has been working on tree sitter for years. Uh, it was originally developed to be integrated into a code editor. So it's a general purpose, highly performant uh, incremental parsing framework. So what that means is like, you know, in tens of milliseconds, even you can, you know, parse from beginning to end, even really large files. Um, and then once you've got a parse tree, most edits, uh, you can compute a new parse tree uh, after making a small edit or even, you know, multi-cursor edits oftentimes in under a millisecond. Um, so that's just a really important ingredient uh, in delivering you know, performance syntax aware features in the editor. Um, and obviously tree sitter is, you know, become super successful. It's used on github.com, it's used in source graph, it's used in uh, NeoVim and a bunch of other editors and there's like tons of grammars for it. Um, yeah, super impressed with what Max has achieved with that. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it was exciting to show this off for the first time. And uh, we've got a private alpha coming in June. It's gonna be a pretty small crew to start out with. We want it to be really high touch, like you know, have some conversations with people, uh, really get a sense of what people's experience is. Uh, so it's gonna be really small to start out with and then we'll be growing from there. Um, and we're particularly interested in people who resonate with what I was saying at the beginning of the talk about the value of synchronous collaboration. If you do pair programming or you do a lot of synchronous conversations around code or you want to, and you feel like your tools are uh, not making the most of that experience, um, we're definitely interested in potentially having you be part of the alpha. Um, we definitely anticipate Zed being just like a useful code editor period. Uh, long term, um, even if you aren't interested in collaborating. Um, and we want to make the single user experience of Zed free and probably open source. Um, but it's the the collaboration, you know, that's our true inspiration for building this whole thing. And so that's those are the kinds of users we want to start with in the alpha. So if you're interested, uh, scan that QR code or go to zed.dev and uh, mention uh, the DevX conference in your little blurb that you type for us. And, um, I don't know, depending on how many people are interested, we'll, we'll see, but uh, hopefully we can get you into the alpha. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, Nathan, thanks so much for, for the talk right just now. Uh, do, I do want to ask a couple of questions. Um, first off, really cool demo. I think this was one, uh, one of the uh, most exciting sessions definitely of today at my number one question would have been when will this go live <laughs> to the public but you just took that away uh we do have uh, a couple of questions from the audience but your uh, teammate max is there answering a couple of them i will pull up one that was not addressed uh which is from van looks great is fuzzing built in maybe you can just comment if you have considered it at all and what's your like if you have any view on on that topic um so i'm not sure I'm going to interpret your question is asking is fuzzing built into the UI framework and the answer is yes. Um, yeah, it's part of our testing infrastructure. Um, and we definitely have plans to at some point open source the UI framework, but right now we're like a small team and just trying to find product market fit as it were. So I don't have like a super clear picture on what the timeline is on that. Um, but yeah, fuzzing will be built in to it. All right. The, concept is pretty amazing and it relates very well to our broader theme of developer experience especially in today's very distributed world and there are lots of companies uh, that are thinking about how they can make their distributed teams work very well together um, that's something that is important to us at Gitpod as well uh, so i think it's a super cool addition why uh why did you think of um 
uh, building a new ID, ID or introducing a new ID rather than building plugins or something similar to that for existing editors? Yeah, I mean, I tried to speak to that a little bit in the talk, but it, it's really just about like, I think in order to execute on this user experience really well and to make it really sing and feel organic and natural to use, that owning the full experience and engineering the entire experience around that concern is warranted. Um, so that, that's a big part of it. Uh, it's also the case that like, we just felt like we had something to offer uh, as an editor in its own right. Meaning like, I, you know, I've never been satisfied with any editor I've ever tried. I'm independent of my dreams around collaboration, you know, for a long time, uh, I've had the dream of building like the ultimate code editor. And I don't feel like uh, Adam was that, you know, there, were, there was a lot to be proud of there, but it, it fell short of, of my ambitions. And so, you know, Zed is the next shot at an editor that you're just going to love using, even if you aren't collaborating in it. Got it. And I think one can tell from your presentation that you are really focused on, uh, on the details, trying to get all the details right. Um, final one, just on this topic of uh, collaboration. So it seems like whenever you're working with your product, are you in a, uh, on a call with your coworkers in parallel? How do you typically, like, how does it look in, in your day-to-day -day work life? Yeah, so on our roadmap is actually integrating, um, you know, audio support and also screen sharing so that if somebody kind of command tabs out of the product, obviously with privacy controls around it, you can follow them into the app you're building or whatever it might be. Um, that's not done yet. So in the short term, we just, you know, usually fire up like a Discord call and a screen sharing session alongside of Zed. Um, and it's a pretty high priority for us to smooth that piece of things out and then go on into some of the like chat type experiences and stuff, uh, sort of not full on talking to each other, but not like a pull request three hours or three days later or something in between and really explore that full gamut of different levels of different time frames of collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. That is very, very interesting. Thinking about different levels between fully synchronous and totally asynchronous and everything that's in between there. Uh, interesting discussion to be had, maybe to be continued in another edition of uh, DevXConf. So thanks so much, Nathan, for joining us and uh, presenting Zed. We look forward to the true public um, in the summer.